All right, so let's start with to be like Jesus again. This quote God has made it the light of health reform to shine upon us in these last days. These are the last days, aren't they? Of course, we are in that time, that critical period. And that it continues that by walking in the light, we may escape many of the dangers to which we shall be exposed. Coming before us are going to be trials like we cannot imagine. We are going to have to start now, today, to practice the health principles and spiritual diligence to be ready, to be fit, to go through, to be overcomers. Satan. He's our great foe. Satan is working with great power to lead men and women to indulge appetite, gratify, gratify inclination, and spend their days in his folly. He presents attractions in a life of selfish enjoyment and of sensual indulgence. Satan is a great foe, and he's going to make that that broad road looks very inviting, but we want to be on the narrow road. We want to be among few, amen? So we're going to talk about abstemiousness, and these are definitions of what that means. Moderation in eating and drinking. You could define it as temperance. The trait of avoiding excesses. Restraint, self-denial. Restraint, especially in the consumption of food or alcohol. So we're needing to abstain from hurtful things. I am not going to tell you this is what you should eat and this is what you should not eat. Many of those things are found in the word of God, the clean and the unclean foods, things that God knew were best for our body as you know, he created them. So he knows best. But what I'm going to tell you today is principles. And then I want you to prayerfully consider, go before the Lord and say, Lord, is what I'm eating, what I'm drinking, my way of living, when I eat, what I eat, what I don't eat, what I listen to, is this honoring you and is the best for my body? You know, I tend to favor this side of the room because that light is a little bit of an interference for me, but I want you to know that I want to speak to you too on this side, Okay. So let's go ahead with Councils on Health and read a few more of these wonderful quotes. Councils on Health, page 573, says, As our first parents lost Eden through the indulgence of appetite, our only hope of regaining Eden is through the firm denial of appetite and passion. Amen. Ab abstemiousness in diet and control of all passions will preserve the intellect and give mental and moral vigor, enabling men to bring all their propensities under the control of higher powers and to discern between right and wrong, the sacred and the common. In a few minutes, we're going to talk about um, Nadab and Abihu who were not able to discern because of what they had done in their lifestyle, their practice, because of alcohol, basically. Now, if we think that denial of our appetites and passions are a little bit of a challenge, and at first they definitely can be because we have trained our bodies and our taste buds to enjoy certain tastes and maybe something that we really enjoy, and I know it's true in my life, some things that I really enjoy, I don't eat today. I, I really like them, but I have made a decision and you're going to have to make similar decisions. Some things that you really like may not be the best for you. And then there's going to be temptations when you go to family function. You are somewhere where you smell that food or you see that food and you know you like it. And you have to again make that decision. I am not going to indulge in that because I know it's not helpful for my body. But if this is a challenge, I'd like you to think of 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. 
for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. We live in a temporal world. Today is temporal. It's going to pass away. Everything about this world is going to pass away. It's temporal. So we look not at the things which are, temp are temporal, but we look at the things that are eternal. Eternal, that's the true value. Amen? I was listening to a doctor, a well-known doctor, Dr. McDougall. He's a health reformer too. And he said this, and it stuck with me. He said, if I were sick with cancer or some horrible disease and to be healthy, I would eat cardboard if that's what it took to have a healthy life and spend more years with my grandchildren, even just cardboard. And we should have the same kind of perspective when it comes to pleasing God, being full of energy and, and fit representatives of Christ so we can share the message. We should be willing to deny ourselves. We should be willing to eat the simplest food, the most healthful food. And I challenge you to adopt that attitude that we will change whatever it takes to be like Jesus and to represent him while on this earth. So here's another quote from Councils on Diet and Foods. All who have a true sense of the sacrifice made by Christ in leaving his home in heaven to come to this world that he might by his own life show man how to resist temptation will cheerfully deny self and choose to be partakers with Christ of his sufferings. Amen? What did Christ give up for us? What we're talking about in these principles is minor, minor compared with the great sacrifice that he made for us. So let's continue on and seeing what is abstemiousness in diet. What does it mean for us? If we are abstemious in our diet, we're going to be rewarded with mental and moral vigor. And it also aids in the control of passions. Do you know that if you eat certain foods, it will actually make you have less control over your desires, not only just for food, but for potential pleasures. So we need to pay attention to what's happening. Controlling our diet will actually control, help us to control the passions. Another quote, and this is from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3. The controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands. When, if they had conquered on this point, they would have had more power to gain the victory over every other temptation. Every other temptation of Satan. But those who are slaves to appetite will fail in perfecting Christian character. Oh, how important, how important it is to control the appetite. Adam and Eve lost the garden because of it. We will lose eternal life if we are not going to have control in this area. Those who are slaves to appetite will fail in perfecting Christian character. The continual transgression of man for 6,000 years has brought sickness, pain, and death as its fruits. And as we near the close of time, which we're nearing the close of time, we might be stepping right into it. Satan's temptation to indulge appetite will be more powerful and more difficult to overcome. That's what's happening. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says this, There hath no temptation taken you, such as is common to man, but God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. And that's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So when we are at that time where, oh, we want what we want, we want that taste. We want that specific food or that specific drink or that specific activity. We need to remember that it's all common to man. 
and that God is with us and he will give us power to overcome that temptation. There's going to be a way of escape if we'll look for it. Let's look at a few of the Bible characters that were examples of, of this. Daniel, of course, you are familiar with that story. And it says here in Daniel 1, 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he, the king, drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. When we could get that perspective, that when we eat what is not right for us, what God has not said is the best for our body, we're actually defiling our body. We're making it unfit. Here's another part in Daniel 1, 15 and 16. It says, and at the end of 10 days, you remember the story. The eunuch, he was concerned. And he gave them, okay, we'll give you a trial, 10 days. But at the end of this 10 days of Daniel and his three friends eating only what was good food, healthful food, vegetables, and pulse, it says. Then at the end of the 10 days, it says here in our scripture verse, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus, Melzar took away the portion of their meat and their wine that they should drink, and he gave them pulse. Pulse is simply, the definition of pulse is a type of food that is not animal meat that includes grains. So vegetables and grains. And then after the time period appointed, when they had to go before the king, here's what it says in Daniel 1.20, the king, what he found. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. That king, 10 times better. Would you like to remember things better? I would. I love to memorize scripture. But I find that in three weeks, if I haven't rehearsed verse, I have to start over. It doesn't stick like I want it to. Maybe you have the same problem. It's rehearsal and rehearsal that helps memorization to happen. But would you like to be 10 times better? It would. I want to be wiser. I want to retain better. I want to have discernment so I can understand the good from the bad. So here in Christian Temple and Bible Hygiene, we are told that Daniel, about Daniel, that he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank, for he knew that such a diet would not strengthen his physical powers or increase his mental capacity. He would not use wine, nor any other unnatural stimulant. He would do nothing to becloud his mind. And God gave him knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and also understanding in all visions and dreams, Daniel 1, 17. Now let's look at that story of Nadab and Abihu. They violated this principle and there was a terrible consequence to pay. Again, in the book, Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, it says both tobacco and liquor break down nerve force and dull the finer perceptions so that the slaves to these habits cannot discern between sacred and common things. An example of the demoralizing effect of intoxicants is seen in the case of Nadab and Abihu. They ventured to partake of wine before they entered the tabernacle to perform the duties of their sacred office. And the result was they could not distinguish between common fire and that which was consecrated to the holy service for this breach of trust they were slain that was a very serious consequence we're going to look at it just a little closer and here again in the same book christian temperance and bible hygiene she goes on to explain some will say if they were intoxicated they could not discern the difference between these fires and why should they be punished but look at what is underlined when they placed the cup to their lips, their minds were clear. They made a choice. They made a choice to take, partake of something that they knew would cloud their senses. When they placed that cup to their lips, 
they made themselves responsible for all the deeds committed while under its influence. And we do the same. And it's not just alcohol. We're going to talk in a few minutes. There's a, there are other things that are stimulants or unnatural to the body. So let's read in Exodus 24, 9 through 11. And I want you to see, especially this first verse, what position did Nadab and Abihu hold for the kingdom of, of Israel under Moses? They were in the top four of that whole, that whole uh, the, the people of Israel. They went up, then went up Moses and Aaron. Now Aaron's two sons, his oldest two sons are Nadab and Abihu. Those four are mentioned specifically. And then it says, and 70 of the elders of Israel. God mentioned those four. They had a very high position of leadership. And don't you know that the target, the bullseye, Satan's bullseye is on the leaders. We need to hold up our leaders because Satan is trying to make a, uh, make a wreck of what we're trying to say. He's trying to diminish that good message that we have to share. And the best way he can do that is to have people say, look at your leader, look at what they're doing. You know, they're, they're not living this life. They're not good representatives. Satan is going to target them to try to get them to fall. And they will take down so many with them. So let's pray for our leaders because look what happened to Nadab and Abihu. And in verse 10, and they saw the God of Israel, they, did you hear that? They saw the God of Israel and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness, what a privilege they had. They had a very close connection with God. And in verse 11, and upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw God and did eat and drink. They saw God and did eat and drink. And we're going to go over to the book of Leviticus, chapter 9, and verse 24. Now, this is the last verse of Leviticus, chapter 9. And it says here, And there came a fire out from before the Lord, and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and fat. And when, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their face. Would you like to be there in that service? Would you like to see the power of God manifested in such glorious way? Nadab and Abihu saw it. And in the very next verse, chapter 10, verse 1, it says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. They had just seen the most glorious manifestation of who God is and his power, and they decided, they made that decide, decision to put the cup of alcohol to their lips, and then they were responsible for the consequences because their, their mind was clouded, and they could not discern. And then Moses is going to address this very thing, Leviticus 10, 9 and 10. Moses addresses the death of Nadab and Abihu, and this is what he says. Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy son with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean. So this is an example for us. One more quote about Nadab and Abihu from Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene. It says, Nadab and Abihu were men of holy office, but by the use of wine, their minds became so clouded that they could not distinguish between sacred and common things. By the offering of strange fire, they disregarded God's command and were slain by his judgments. Now, in this same book, Ellen White gives the example of Alexander the Great. And she says it was found, Alexander the Great found it much easier to subdue kingdoms than to rule his own spirit. Great leader, well known even today. After conquering nations, this so-called great man fell through the indulgence of appetite 
a victim of intemperance. So the historian Diodorus says that Alexander was struck with pain after drinking a huge bowl of unmixed wine and died of stomach pain, drinking the quote from Diodorus continues, drinking undiluted wine, worse, wine that is foiled can be exceptionally bad, right? That, that was that resulted in death. Now let's look quickly at Samson. He's another example of a man God called out. When the Lord would raise up Samson as a deliverer of his people, he enjoined upon the mother. Mothers, you have a, you have a role to play in the rearing of your children. If you don't teach your children to deny their selfish desires and their desire of appetite, food that is not the best for their bodies, you're creating a problem for the future. They're going to grow up being the same child as they are an adult, the same adult as they are a child, I should say. So we have a work to do now to train those little taste buds and to help them understand what is self-sacrifice? What is self-discipline? I want you to pay attention because the mother of Samson was instructed. He enjoined upon the mother correct habits of life before the birth of her child. And the same prohibition was to be imposed from the first, from the first upon the child. For he was to be consecrated to God as a Nazarite from his birth. Continuing on about this same story of Samson, the angel of God appeared to the wife of Manoah and informed her that she should have a son. And in view of this, he gave her the important directions. Now, therefore, beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine, nor strong drink, nor eat anything unclean, not eat as it says, the quote, exactly, and eat not any unclean thing. So we have to think about this. All of the Old Testament stories, all of the stories of the New Testament, they're all examples for us, right? We read this and we get instruction from God, just as though my name were put in there and your name was put in that text. Now we're going to look quickly at John the Baptist, another man called of God, very important. From the same book, Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene. John the Baptist was a reformer. Are we reformers? Of course we're reformers. To him was committed the great work for the people of his time. And I'm going to say to you is committed the great work for the people of this time. Amen. And in preparation for that work, all his habits were carefully regulated, even from his birth. The angel Gabriel was sent from heaven to instruct the parents of John in the principles of health reform. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, said the heavenly messenger, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. And we can find that story in Luke 1 15. I believe with all my heart, that if we will pay close attention to the principles of health reform and apply them to our lives, our sphere of influence amongst our community, the people that we know, the communities we live in, will greatly increase. And we will have a greater platform to spread the good news. But we need to pay close attention to the preparation needed. Now, here's a, here's a continuing in that same quote, John separated himself from his friends and from the luxuries of life, dwelling alone in the wilderness and subsisting upon a purely vegetable diet. The simplicity of his dress, which was a garment woven of camel's hair, was a rebuke to the extravagance and display of the people of his generation, especially of the Jewish priests. His diet also of locusts and wild honey was a rebuke to the gluttony that everywhere prevailed. And continuing one more part of this quote. The work of John was foretold by the prophet Malachi. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers. Do you see that problem today? I see it in my family even. The hearts of the children are not respectful of the fathers and the parents. There is a lack of love. Love is growing cold in this world. 
but we are here to turn the hearts of the people to God and, and God will then um, assist and aid in everything we need to do as we do that. We're ambassadors for him. So we want to be like Elijah. Elijah was called to an extreme sacrifice, but God in his word is telling us what we are called to do, to be representatives of him. Let's continue. John the Baptist went forth in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way of the Lord and to turn the people to the wisdom of the just. He was a representative of those living in the last days. Elijah is our example. And that's how we should be. To whom God has entrusted sacred truths to present before the people, to prepare the way for the second appearing of Christ. And the same principles of temperance, which John practiced, should be observed by those who in our day are to warn the world of the coming of the Son of Man. Now I'm going to just touch on three small areas of temperance that we should observe. One is tea, the other is coffee, and the other is alcohol. I'm just going to touch quickly on these. They're quite prevalent, and it seems that tea and coffee especially are creeping in as an acceptable beverage for Adventists. And so let's read what it says in Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene. It says tea is a stimulant and to a certain extent produces intoxication. It gradually impairs the energy of the body and mind. Its first effect is exhilarating because it quickens the motions and the living of the living machinery. It has caffeine, right? So you feel an increase in energy. Continuing in the quote, and the tea drinker thinks that he is doing him a great service. What do they say? They get up in the morning and say, oh, I've got to have my cup of coffee so I can get moving. And they think that's good or a cup of tea, because caffeine does stimulate. However, let's look at this further. Back to the quote. But this is the mistake. When its influence is gone, the unnatural force, when its influence is gone, the unnatural force abates. And the result is languor and debility corresponding with the artificial vivacity imparted the second effect of tea drinking is headache, wakefulness, palpitation of the heart, indigestion, trembling, many other evils. So this is not a good thing for us to partake of. This is, a, this is one of the very clear things that she addresses. Coffee is another one with caffeine. Coffee is a harmful indulgence. It temporarily excites the mind to unwanted action, but the after effect is exhaustion, prostration, paralysis of the mental, moral, and physical powers. The mind becomes enervated, and unless through determined effort the habit is overcome, the activity of the brain, oh, listen to this last part, the activity of the brain is permanently lessened. Well, I need every brain cell I have to be active and working well. And I don't want to interfere with that process. Now let's go to tobacco. Tobacco is a slow, insidious poison. Its effects are more difficult to cleanse from the system than are those of liquor. It binds the victim in even stronger bands of slavery than does the intoxicating cup. It is a disgusting habit. Oh, I agree. Defiling the user and very annoying to others. We rarely pass through a crowd, but men will puff their poisonous breath in our faces. It is unpleasant, if not um, dangerous, to remain in a railway car or in a room where the atmosphere is impregnated with the fumes of liquor and tobacco. It is or now here's the question, is it honest thus to contaminate the air which others must breathe? Just common courtesy tells you that what you do should not negatively affect another. That's common courtesy. And here's the last quote in this section on stimulousness. Again, Christian temperance and Bible hygiene. Every man has the opportunity to a great extent of making himself whatever he chooses to be. 
the blessings of this life and also the of the immortal state are within his reach. He may build up a character of solid work, gaining new strength at every step. He may advance daily in knowledge and wisdom, conscious of new delights as he progresses, adding virtue to virtue, grace to grace. His faculties will improve by use. The more wisdom he gains, the greater will be his capacity for acquiring. As you learn, you can have the capacity to learn more. His knowledge, his intelligence, his knowledge and virtue will thus develop into greater strength and more perfect symmetry. So let's make an effort to apply the principles. Let's make an effort to um, draw closer to God to study his word more. And the more we study, the more we'll understand and the more we'll retain. That's a promise. So now we're gonna go on to diet and digestion. Now this is sensitive, but I don't know what's available here for you food-wise. What I have experienced at this camp meeting has been wonderful. The greens, the vegetables, and the simple food prepared in a simple manner. That is perfect. That's been wonderful. Let's read from Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene. Through appetite, Satan controls the mind and the whole being. If Satan controls the mind, can you be spiritually tuned into God? I don't think so. Through appetite, Satan controls the mind and the whole being. Thousands who might have lived have passed into the grave. Physical, mental, and moral wrecks because they sacrificed all their powers to the indulgence of appetite. Do you realize that you are giving your power away to an evil force when you indulge in appetite? Here's another quote, Christian education. Diet exerts a powerful influence upon the health. Some have never made a determined effort to control the appetite or to observe proper rules in regard to diet. They eat too much, even between meals, and some, uh, it says, even at their meals, and some eat between meals whenever the temptation is presented. If those who profess to be Christians desire to solve the question so perplexing to them, why their minds are so dull, why their religious aspirations are so feeble, they need not, in many instances, go further than the table. Here is cause enough if there were no other. Another quote, Bible, Christian temperance and Bible hygiene. A diet lacking in proper elements of nutrition brings reproach upon the cause of health reform. We are mortal and must supply ourselves with food that will give proper nourishment to the body. God does not prohibit the, he, the he, excuse me, God did not prohibit the Hebrews from eating swine's flesh merely to show his authority, but because it is not a proper article of food for man. God never created the swine to be eaten in any circumstances. It is impossible for the flesh of any living creature to be healthful when filled is its natural element and when it feeds upon every detestable thing. So this is a very clear instruction against eating of swine's flesh, pork, pepperoni on pizzas, things like that that are pork products. Going on here to another quote, letters and manuscripts. I saw that many were sickly among the remnant. We are the remnant, right? Many are sick among the remnant who have made themselves so by indulging their appetites. If we wish good health, we must take special care of the health that God has given us. Deny the unhealthy appetite. Eat less fine food. Eat coarse food free from grease. Then as you sit at the table to eat you can, from the heart, ask God's blessing upon the food, can derive strength from coarse, wholesome food. God will be pleased to graciously bless it, and it will be a benefit to the receiver. So one of the strongest, again, another quotation, one of the strongest temptations that man has to meet is upon what? The point of appetite. The strongest, one of the strongest temptations, if we can control that, we can master. In the beginning, the Lord made man upright. He created, he was created with a perfect, balanced mind. 
perfectly balanced mind, the size and strength of all his organs being fully harmoniously developed. But through the seditions of the wily foe, the prohibition of God was disregarded and the laws of nature wrought out their full penalty. And a couple more quotes here. Adam and Eve were permitted to eat of all the trees in the Garden of Eden. In their garden home, save one. The Lord said to the holy pair, in the day that ye eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, ye shall surely die, Genesis 3. And then another quote, Christian temperance, since the first surrender to appetite, mankind have been growing more and more self-indulgent until health has been sacrificed on the altar of appetite. And example after example might be cited to show the effects of yielding to appetite. It seemed a small matter to our first parents to transgress the command of God and then that one little act, the eating from a tree that was so beautiful to the sight and so pleasant to the taste, but it broke their allegiance to God and opened the gates to a flood of guilt and woe that has deluged the world. It is impossible for those who give the reins to appetite to attain to Christian perfection. Impossible. Let's control that appetite. Here are some examples now of things that we are told in our, in, by our prophet that we should avoid. She says, flesh meats, butter, cheese, rich pastry, spiced foods, and condiments are freely partaken of by both old and young. These things do their work in deranging the stomach, exciting the nerves, and enfeebling the intellect. The blood-making organs cannot convert, convert such things into good blood. The grease cooked in the food renders it difficult to digest. The effect of cheese is deleterious. Fine flour bread does not impart to the system the nourishment that is to be found in unbolted wheat bread. And then the positive. Now here's what she says. About fruits, grains, and vegetables prepared in a simple way, free from spice and grease of all kinds, make the most healthful diet. They impart nourishment to the body and give a power of endurance and a vigor of intellect that are not produced by a stimulating diet. So we're going to talk about digestion. We're going to put good nutritious food in our bodies, but we need to pay attention to the, to the method of digestion so that we can know how to cooperate fully with it. Here's a quote again, Christian temperance and Bible hygiene. A second meal should never be eaten unless the stomach has had time to recover from the labor of digesting the preceding meal. I'm going to stop here for a moment. That's why we don't eat between meals. If we eat breakfast at seven and then we eat lunch at one, we've had a proper amount of time for the, the digestion of breakfast. But if we eat a snack at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, the digestive process has to start over again. The stomach is a moving organ. It is mixing, mixing, mixing the food that you put in with enzymes, with digestive juices so that it can be assimilated into the body. But before the stomach will release the food that you have put in into the um, intestine area where it can be absorbed into the, into the body, it has to be the right temperature and it has to be the right consistency. And that is called like a chime. It's, it, it works into a liquid and then it can be put in. However, if you eat breakfast at seven and your, your stomach is working, 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 you make your stomach work more than any other organ of the body typically. So your stomach is working, 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 and it's just about to release that food into the intestines to be absorbed into the body by the nutrients and minerals. And then you put a little something in. Maybe it's just a couple crackers. Maybe it's a little candy. Maybe it's a sugary drink that's cold. Your stomach has to start over because that new food, that new beverage that's been introduced has to also get to the same temperature and the same consistency. So now it's got to start up. It's going to take another four to five hours. And then in two hours, you're going to eat lunch. 
and then you're going to eat a snack at three or four. Then you're going to eat a dinner. Your poor stomach has not had time to do its work. And the nutrients that should have gone in are now spoiled. It turns into like an alcohol. If you eat between meals, you're actually having an alcoholic effect in your body. So please be aware that when you eat, you should leave five hours and you should drink only water between. And then you eat another meal. For me, I think the very best way is to eat only the two meals a day and nothing at night but one. So now I'm gonna go back to the quote. When we lie down at night, the stomach should have its work all done. That is, as well as other portions of the body that may enjoy the rest. Have its work all done, that is, as well as other portions of the body. And then if everything has been accomplished, the digestive process has completed, then we can lay down and enjoy rest. But if more food is forced upon it, the digestive organs are put in motion again to perform the same round of labor through the sleeping hours, which is going to take away from the rest that we need. Okay, so let anyone take a course, irritates him in any way and see how quickly he manifests in patients. You know what we eat affects how we act. If we eat foods that are not good for us, that are irritants or stimulants, it's gonna affect how we act and we're not gonna be patient and we're going to be having discord in our heart because we're snappy, we're, we're not pleasant and content. So going on to the quote, he cannot without special grace speak or act calmly. He casts a shadow where'er he goes. We should be the light of the world, right? So how can anyone say then, it's nobody business what I eat or drink? Because what you eat or drink affects your whole family. It affects where you work. It affects your community. It affects your church. Let's look a little bit deeper about dyspepsia is simply indigestion. That's a word for indigestion. And a quote from Councils on Health says, if your time to eat is limited, do not bolt your food, but eat less. Bolt means to eat in a hurry. Just whip it in, you know, just shovel it in as fast as you can. So do not bolt your food, but eat less and masticate, chew slowly. The benefit derived from food does not depend on how much quantity is eaten as on its thorough digestion. Gratification of taste does not depend so much on the amount of food swallowed as on the length of time it spends in the mouth. Those who are excited, anxious, or in a hurry would do well not to eat until they have found rest or relief for the vital powers already severely taxed cannot supply the necessary digestive fluids. I'm gonna come back to the length of time that it's in the stomach with a story in just a minute. But let's go on here. Have you noticed people who put a large bite of food in their mouth and almost immediately, you don't even see the jaw move. They swallow and you see the big lump go down their throat. I was in a restaurant and I saw this young man. He'd put a bite in and swallow immediately. And it was hard for him to swallow. He had to go mm, to swallow that lump. I thought, what did, did his parents not tell him he had teeth? Do you know there's no teeth in your mouth? Or excuse me, there's no teeth in your stomach. They're only here and they're for a reason. They're to masticate the food, to chew the food up. I've heard the quote like this, drink your food and chew your water. Now that doesn't sound right, does it? Drink your food. But what it, this is what it means. Chew your food so much that by the time you swallow it, it's liquefied. And then when you drink your water, don't drink a quart at a time. Sip water regularly. And that is the best way for the body to assimilate the water. You see, there's an enzyme in your mouth. There's an enzyme in your mouth. It's called amylase. And it breaks down starches. Chewing the food into what they call chyme, which is that liquidy uh, substance, which is almost liquid, is a thorough preparation for the second part of digestion. As you chew here, the body activates peristalsis. And the whole digestive system works as one. When you start chewing here, your body, the peristalsis, helps the intestine to say, it's time to eliminate what we ate at the last meal. 
And so then there's a, an urge to go and eliminate. So we chew here, peristalsis is a result. If you don't chew, you don't get that result. And you're going to end up with stagnant bowel in your colon that's not good for you that will cause disease. So chewing the food into chyme, which is almost liquid as a thorough preparation for the second part of digestion. As you chew, the body activates peristalsis. This affects the entire digestive system, even activating bowel elimination, which is the final stage of digestion. And I only have a couple more slides here. When you begin chewing, glands in your mouth and throat begin to secrete saliva. This process can start with the sight and the smell of food. The liquid aids digestion, moistens your mouth, reduces infections in the mouth and throat, and it helps to protect your teeth and gums. So how does it taste, the food, how does it taste? Well, this is the job of that saliva, salivary glands. When your saliva begins to break down your food, the taste buds on your tongue and in the roof of your mouth sense how the food tastes. Taste buds contain gustatory glands, which send taste signals to the brain. The taste buds, okay, this is how you sense the five basic tastes of food, which are sweet and sour and salty and bitter and savory. Nerves in your mouth, in your nose, in your mouth, in your eyes, in your throat, let you experience the other qualities of food, like the heat of the spicy food or the coolness of peppermint. So chew your food thoroughly. And I have a story to help you understand um, and help you remember, I hope. I read a story about a man in a concentration camp in Germany at the end of World War II. And when the allies came in and they went into these concentration camps and all of these poor people, they were emaciated. They had not been fed for some four years or more. And so they were so sick that some of them, even though they were at that time offered good food, they, they died anyways. They were too far gone. But there was one man in the camp and the allies were, were noticing him and he didn't look as emaciated and sickly as the others. And so they went to him and they said, you haven't been here very long, obviously. So um, what happened and what the allies were trying to do is get them placed back with their families, trying to reunite families that were separated by this horrible war. The man said, well, I've been here four years, just like the others. I came in with the first load. And they said, well, why aren't you emaciated? Why, aren't, why don't you look the same way they do? And he said, because the little bit of food that they gave me, I kept it in my mouth. I refused to swallow until it was totally liquid. Sometimes he would keep that food in his mouth two hours. Well, that takes a little bit of... Um, in, in, you know, some kind of strength, because when I have food in my mouth, I want to swallow. But he determined, he kept it in his mouth, sometimes up to two hours before he swallowed it. The nutrients in that food, he absorbed better than those who ate their food quickly. And I want you to think about that today when you eat lunch, to chew slowly, to make sure it gets to the right consistency in the mouth. Remember that it's going to have a work in the stomach to do, needs to get to the right consistency there with those other enzymes. And don't put anything in your mouth between meals, just one. And I think that you will find that you have more energy. And I'm gonna end with this text, whatever, therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Thank you. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Precious Heavenly Father, it is with great awe that we come before you right now, knowing that you are the creator of our bodies and that we have been given a job to do on this earth. And that we want to be prepared and we want to be your servants and we want to be your ambassadors to shed the, spread the truth of who you are to the world around us. And I thank you, Father. I pray that what has been shared about health and the digestion and 
what things we should partake of and what things we shouldn't. Father, give us courage and strength of character so that we can make right choices in our lives and that we can be better prepared, healthier, and more full of energy so that we can serve you. We just right now surrender ourselves into your hands. And I pray that you would help us every decision that we make today to be done to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.